We are continuing on this morning through our series, Empowered, Empowered by Faith. This thing, Empowered, we're doing all year um, because Jesus was, I think, the most empowering person who ever walked the face of the earth. And he wants us to reflect his nature and similarly to be an empowered, but also an empowering community. If you think about who Jesus empowered, he empowered children. Uh, to, he, he put a little child on his knee and said, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. He empowered women in an age where women were downtrodden and treated as less important than cattle. He empowered the outcast and the sick and the ostracized. He was, as I say, the most empowering person that ever walked the face of the earth. And he empowered a group of young, likely teenage fishermen and people who the educated society cast aside. And he said, go and do greater things than you have seen me do. He took off the lid and he said, go, I'm with you. I'm with you, and because I'm with you, you can do anything. And he wants each and every one of us to understand that because he is with you, if you're a Christian here today, he is inside you. And because he's inside you, you can do anything. You can go and change the world one little step at a time. Scripture says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. What might your small beginning be? Tomorrow morning in the office, this afternoon with your family, what might your small beginning be? But Jesus is with you, and he empowers you to live with expectation, with faith. Faith, my, my working definition is belief plus expectation. At least that was my working definition until this week. And as I was preparing this message, I was just challenged to actually tweak it slightly, that it's faith is belief plus expectant behavior of some kind, because expectation we can kind of keep to ourselves and we can keep it nice and quiet. We can hold it and nobody else sees it. But actually scripture encourages us that our faith is going to look like something, isn't it? Um, When you look at uh, passages like here in James chapter 2, 18 to 20, um, it says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Faith apart from works is useless. There's, there's something that you can see in a person of faith. Faith looks like something. When Jesus comes back, his, his provocation to his disciples, he says, when the Son of Man comes back again, will he find faith on earth? You can't find something that doesn't look like something. Will Jesus find faith? In our lives, his his provocation to us is to be a people whose lives look like something, look attractive. If you remember back to when um, Tom and Susie Brock were amongst us um, at the September time, October time last year, Susie's provocation to us was that, does your life draw the question? When you live your life amongst your friends and your neighbors and your community, do people look at you and go, What is it about you? Why are you like that? Does your faith look like something? And as we go into today, we want to recognize the fact that whilst our God is the God of the reasonable, the probable, the possible, the practical, and the comfortable, which we all like, let's face it, that's where we like to live, he is also the God of the unreasonable, the improbable, the impossible, the impractical, and the uncomfortable. This is what we want, this is what we will embrace if we embrace a life of faith. Because faith is often not reasonable, practical, comfortable. This church is not a church founded on common sense trustees in the room will begin to shake in their boots at this moment, but, and we love what they do, and they keep us out of prison, and we are grateful for that, but this church is not founded on common sense and logic and reason. If you want that, 
join a gym, join the Rotary Club, join any one of the other societies that are doing good things in this town, and I applaud the work of many, many agencies that are doing wonderful works. But the works of the kingdom of God require us to be operating in these categories, in the unreasonable, the improbable, impossible, impractical, and uncomfortable. If you're not experiencing something of that as you follow Jesus, perhaps you're kidding yourself. Happy Christmas, happy new year. <laughs> it's a really comfortable message we're starting with today. We're looking at a couple of stories out of Hebrews and kind of jumping out of these ones. This well-known uh, reference here, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. And God invited him to build an ark. And that was not comfortable for little old Noah. That was not a reasonable request. Noah did not trip along to Ikea for the flat pack how to build an ark kit. You know, it was, I'm so glad for his sake that he didn't have to use one of those strange little Allen keys and kind of wind all the pieces of the ark together using that. It was altogether unreasonable. The next verse talks about Abraham. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him and his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Noah did not have a five-year plan. Noah had no idea where he would be two weeks from day one. His goal was not as industry and commercial experts tell us, a smart goal, specific, measurable, achievable, reasonable, and time-bounded. It was just go. Just go, and that's it. I'll show you. Totally unreasonable. Come on, Lord. How do you expect me to sell this vision to my family? But he stepped out in faith, and he went without the answers, without any guarantee Apart from God's promise, I will be with you. Is that promise enough for you? Because it's as true today as it was for Noah. I will be with you. I find Noah and Abraham inspiring, but a little bit hard to to lay hold of because, let's face it, whilst some of us might build IKEA furniture in the next couple of days, not many of us will build an ark. Not many of us will leave home with no idea where we're going, trusting that God is going to guide every step. I find their example inspiring but hard to, hard to lay hold of. I find this quote by Bill Johnson very, very helpful because we see the great faith of these giants and we think, how can I aspire to that? But as Bill says, great faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. And, and quiet trust is something that I feel I can aspire to. I can, I can step out. I, I can trust God in that next decision. I can trust God to respond to the invitation to invite someone to Alpha. I, I can trust God for that. And that's... I feel the, the foundation that he wants to lay into our lives, the invitation that he puts before us today is, put quiet trust in me. Put your quiet trust in me and let me show you what I can do. This is, this is the path of discipleship where simply the, Lord's, the Lord invites us into something and our response is, you are my Lord, you are my Lord. You are my Savior, but you are also my Lord. And therefore, I'll say yes. That is quiet trust put into practice. I've invited Tracy to come and give us just a short story of how God invited her into quiet trust. So we welcome Tracy and someone give her a microphone if that's possible. Welcome. 
Ja. Oh, yes. Um, I believe that God gave me a vision to have a team in the foyer here um, during the week so that people could come in and be prayed for and meet with him. Because in his kindness and his love, he is calling people into salvation and relationship with him. So last term on Wednesday afternoons, we put this sign outside and we wanted this to be led by Jesus and we wanted to just be obedient to just be there when he drew people in. Well, very few people have come in, but we kept on going. We were trusting that God is faithful. And we've used the time to pray for the town and to bless the businesses and the schools and so on. And we also pray for the people who walk past um, because many of them will read that sign and they will turn and look inside the foyer and then they will carry on walking. So we've just been praying that that sign itself will just make people more open to have dreams about Jesus and to be thinking about him. Well, just before Christmas, we were in the foyer and a lady came in. She was going through some traumatic circumstances and she had woken up that morning knowing that she had to get in the car and drive to Stortford and come to this church. Wow. So as she shared with us, one team member prayed for peace for her and encouraged her to forgive the people who were causing that traumatic situation. Another team member asked her whether she had experienced God's presence when we'd prayed. And would she like to invite Jesus into her life? Well, she said, yes, she had felt God's presence and his peace. And yes, she did want to. So she prayed and she invited Jesus into her heart. And as she left, taking a Why Jesus booklet with her, another team member assured her that God was with her now forever, that she could speak to him at any time, and she would never face any situation alone again. Isn't God amazing? <laughs> he transforms a deeply troubling situation into salvation and victory. It's incredible. In the summer, that lady's son had been to Holiday Bible Week, and he'd loved it. And she had visited the prayer tent and asked for prayer. And she said that both those things had encouraged her to come to church that Wednesday morning. So maybe you played your part in her journey towards Jesus. So please be encouraged to keep going with whatever it is that you are doing, whatever God's calling you to, because God is faithful. And you are such a faithful family of people. And, and I can see Jesus' smile when he sees us encouraging each other to keep going. So please pray for us and please pray for each other that we will all see God's kingdom breaking through more and more as we serve him. And Jesus, we love you. <laughs> you are so worthy of our obedient faith and all the glory goes to you. Amen. 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 So good. So good. So good. Do you, do you, do you see the... The, the kind of partnership that took place there. There was the invitation. There was a, a gentle direction from our father to Tracy and as she shared the vision to some other folks who gathered with her. And I tell you, I, you know, week in, week out on a Wednesday, I'd be upstairs in the office and downstairs there'd be this team waiting and, and wondering, well, is anyone gonna come today? And then that one moment just before Christmas, and a lady's life is transformed forever because salvation is the greatest miracle that can happen. It's the, it's the one miracle that will last for all eternity. As we heard last week when Rihanna, not Rihanna, who got baptized last week? Megan, 
and, uh, and Eleanor got baptized last week, and they both spoke of how God had healed their bodies, and we celebrate that like crazy, but someone turning their life over to Jesus is a, is a miracle that lasts for all eternity, that this team of people stepped into through obedience, through the quiet trust of a, of a moment. Do you, are you sensing God's invitation to something? It'll be different for everyone in the room. But that's where he wants us to be. The expression of obedient faith for the majority of us will be in our unseen day-to-day decisions of quiet trust. They are unlikely to be the great, massive, life-changing, earth-shattering moments. I want to share with you some that I've had in the last few weeks. My recent faith decisions to worship God despite disappointment. Anybody experienced disappointment in the last couple of weeks? The decision to keep worshiping God, to keep proclaiming, you are good, you are faithful, you are kind, I can trust you. That's a faith decision. That's an expression of quiet trust. To say what needed to be said and have a difficult conversation and to do it with love and with gentleness and with kindness, That was a faith decision that I've had to make in the last couple of weeks. So much easier just to bury it, isn't it? But in that moment, I knew, okay, Father, I'm going to hold your hand with this. I'm going to step into this, and I want it to glorify you. I wonder if any of you got that faith decision to make. Could be with your spouse. Could be with a colleague at work. Could be with another member here at CCBS. A bigger one for me was to not say everything. (laughs) Who laughed? Isn't it true that sometimes to not say is actually a bigger faith decision than the decision to say? Particularly in this social media rich world that we live in, we just feel it's our God-given right to tap it all out and share it. And actually, sometimes it requires a greater level of trust in the goodness of our God, the fact that he's got it whether I open my mouth or not. And and that is, again, a simple decision of quiet trust. Perhaps he's inviting you into that. To keep giving financially despite financial pressure. Who spent more than they planned to at Christmas? (laughs) These things can impact us. These things can, can, can come along and bite us. And when we see that standing order going out to the church at the start of the month, we think, oh, crumbs. Really? And there's that temptation. But to keep going. It's often keep doing the good things that the Father has invited you into. To keep contending for miracles and persevering for breakthroughs. I'm praying for a number of people, a number of situations who need God's breakthrough, who need that situation to suddenly and miraculously shift. And for many of those, it hasn't happened yet. But again, it's to keep going, to keep contending, to keep trusting, to keep believing that because he is who he says he is, he will do what he has promised he will do. These are things which, you know, unlike the ark building and the nation changing stuff, these things come along to us, I think, most days. And the thing is, God meets us where we are at. This little passage from Mark 9 speaks about a situation where the disciples brought a boy to Jesus, and when the spirit that was possessing that boy saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. If you can do anything, said the father, have compassion on us and help us. That measure of faith, if you can do anything, that hardly moves the needle on the Richter scale. Like that is as low level of faith as I think is recorded anywhere in Scripture. Well, you know, if, God, if you are actually powerful at all. Now, if I was Jesus in that situation, I might have said, well, go away and work out whether you believe I can and then come back to me. But Jesus does not take that opportunity to give this person a hard lesson. He takes 
this minuscule, almost zero expression of faith and says, I am able. I am completely able. And he welcomes his father and he uses this as an opportunity to invite that father into a greater expression of faith by providing the miracle that perhaps we might think he didn't even deserve. And I just want to say today, if you look at yourself, if you look at your faith life and you say, you know what, that sums up where I'm at, I'm not even sure if God can, then God wants to say to you, I welcome that level of faith. I welcome you where you are at. I want to put my arms around that situation. I want to pour myself into that situation. And I want to prove to you that not only can I, but I will. Because he wants to grow our faith. Here's an encouraging statement for you. God has determined that everything of eternal significance that you set out to achieve in this life is impossible unless it's done in partnership with him. Because there's an invitation in that to partner with him, to draw close to him. How can we fulfill this commission unless we do it in intimate relationship with the Father. How can we go and make disciples of a small town in England called Bishop Stortford unless we do it together with him? In every command or instruction, God's invitation to us is this, stay close to me until everything that I can do becomes what you can do. This is what he this is this is why he gives us instructions and commands that he knows we cannot fulfill. This is why he says pray for the sick. This is why he says raise the dead. This is why he says disciple nations. All these things we cannot do unless we do them with him. And his longing in every single instruction is that we will catch hold of this idea that when we draw close to him, so close then we become like him. And suddenly we find that we are doing the things that only he can do because of intimacy. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to bring us joy. Look at these two verses. We're almost done. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. There is a reward from heaven every time you say yes to him. Our expectation, therefore, is that when we say yes to God, he is going to bring a blessing from his kingdom into our lives that is going to enhance us. And that is not greedy or self-centered because he has told us that it is his desire. John 10.10 10, Jesus says, I have come to give you everything in abundance, life in its fullness until you overflow. That is the heart of our Father. It is that heart that underpins every instruction, every commandment, every invitation. I want to give you more. There's a very short video clip I want to show you, and I want you to catch from this the heart that I believe God wants us to have when he invites us to obey. Are you ready? Leave it on. I stay. Do you see the joy in obedience? <laughs> Do you see the sense of, ah, I'm going for it, yes. You said, come, I'm, I'm coming. I'm going to jump in circles, and then I'm going to sit and go, yeah, what are you going to give me? This is the reward, the reward of heaven. 
the, the lavish love of our Father's heart that when he says, come, come on, come on, come and do this, come and, come and partner with me in that, he wants us to have that heart attitude that says, oh yes, 110%, I'm in, I'm in. In what way is he inviting you to express obedient faith, quiet trust in this season? Time's up, but close your eyes for 15 seconds. Holy Spirit, will you speak to each and every person in the room and show us specifically one thing that you're inviting us to partner with you in in these next days? And Heavenly Father, will you show us your lavish heart that is full of love, that wants to reward us and fill our lives with abundant blessings. In Jesus' name.